Dear gracious, <clears throat> gracious Heavenly Father, we're just thankful to be in your house this morning. Amen. Lord, we just are thankful for thy many blessings and how that you have always been there, Lord, and been with us, Lord. We just come together, dear Jesus. We enjoy seeing what one another, and we thank you for the building and the comforts. But, Lord God, we've come here to hear from you. We've come here to meet with you, Lord Jesus. You said in your word that you would be here, and, Lord, that's enough for us to stand on and trust in, Lord. We know that you are here amongst us, and we just pray that you would take control Speak to each heart, Lord. Have preeminence in everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we'll read again in Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the 11th verse. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I think it's in um, Isaiah, so just before Jeremiah here, that uh, the, the word comes forth that, you know, he'll send a, that a, that a babe will be born to a virgin, that the promise of the Son of God is, is given there, and we know that hundreds of years later, um, the Virgin Mary was just walking along, and an angel of, of the Lord met with her and said, you know, this, this scripture is going to be fulfilled in your life, and she believed it. And, you know, the Lord says here that you know, he has thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And, you know, Israel really was looking for that uh, military conquer to come in and deliver them from the Gentiles. And Jesus came, and it wasn't, it wasn't what they were thinking. But yet, God had his thoughts for them. The, the whole time, even though, it, even though it came completely contrary to what they were thinking and what they were expecting, it still came according to the thoughts of God for them. Amen. And Jesus came and walked upon this earth, and, you know, the, the same God that had given them the commandments for all of these animal sacrifices for hundreds of years was the same God that had in his thoughts to send a son to walk amongst them in flesh, that he would actually be born a baby over a manger, that he, he would not be the big mighty conqueror, at least militarily, that they were looking for. This was all in the thought of God. And then knowing that he would die on a cross and that, that that sacrifice would make an atonement for our our sins and our healing. And that those were all thoughts that God had for each and every one of us. Not just for Israel, even though they they just had their 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 thinking was all wrong and their expectations were all wrong. But it was all in the thoughts of God for peace and not of evil. That, you know, before the foundation of the world, I think it was read Wednesday night, the, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before a lamb was ever, yeah, that's kind of interesting. <clears throat> and I, I, this just came to me, but, you know, the old, the old kind of conversation about the chicken or the egg. The word of God says that the lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world when as yet no lamb had ever been created or lived. Amen. So which came first? The lamb that we think of when we refer to the lamb of God or the lamb of God. But, you know, his thoughts, they just, they, uh, they don't change. 
they're eternal. And if we're in his thoughts, you know, he's got everything in control. You know, he says that his thoughts for us are for peace and not of evil to give us an expected end. And that was true when Jeremiah wrote this. And that was true when Isaiah wrote that a virgin shall conceive. And that was true hundreds of years later when Jesus was born in a little manger to a virgin and a man that had taken her to be his wife. And the whole world looked down on them like they were sinners. Amen. And yet God's word applied for thoughts of peace and not of evil. And then the disciples follow him and love him and, and believe that he's the son of God. And then they're completely lost and confused when he actually goes to a cross and gets crucified. He tells them face to face, I'm going to die. And they just, they don't get it. The thoughts of God that are for peace and not for evil can sometimes just be so different than our human thinking. In fact, it's always different than our human thinking. The thoughts of God don't come down to our human thinking. But we have to take the mind of Christ and come up to the thoughts of God. He doesn't change his thoughts for us. You know, Israel wanted a mighty military conqueror to rid them from the Romans. And God's thoughts of peace. Now, they thought that that would bring them peace. They wanted the mighty general to come in and wipe out the enemy and bring them peace and prosperity and deliver them from evil. Their thoughts, you know, you could say that their thinking was in line with the word. And yet God brought them peace and had thoughts of for them, not of evil, and sent a baby who grew up according to the world in shame and in, in an evil home, evil spoken of home, family, and went to a cross and died. And that was all the thoughts of God. In Psalms, the 40th chapter, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Can't help after the last few services to think if that new song isn't something akin to the Song of Solomon, or at least that drawing. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. In, in, the, in the Schofield here, it says, he brought, me up out, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit. And in the, the median there, it says, in the Hebrew, it is a, a pit of noise. I just thought that was so fitting for the day we live in. You know, this world is just like a pit of noise. There's politics and elections and pandemics and economics and stimulus packages and sports, quarantined, entire, entire athletic uh, organizations are quarantined. Um, you know, all the noise that's all around us. And then if, if you read that little book that's out there about music, you know, you, you see some things in that. I mean, you can't go to the store. We, we can't even go buy our groceries without having evil music played in our ears. And it's, I mean, it's attractive. There's a, it's actually a, a rock and roll musician. He said that music is, is magic. It's the greatest magic. And there are many of those rock stars that they, they have said that at points in the concerts, they know they have absolute control over the audience. I mean, that's power. And you wonder why these people sell their souls to the devil. That's power. They have absolute control and power over thousands upon thousands of people. They feel that. They feel that high. 
That's why they resort to other things when they're not on the stage, because they lose that. But just all this noise that's around us. And you know, the scripture tells us to, to have this mind which was in Christ. And, you know, we, we, don't, we don't, the Lord doesn't, I mean, he does reach down to us, but, you know, we're, we're not trying to convince God to think our ways. But we've got to come up and, and have his mind and think his ways. He, he lifts us up out of a pit of noise. The noise and the chaos and everything going on around us. And, you know, what was once a wonderful time of year, and there are very slim remnants of that yet today in the world, but mostly it's just a commercial deal breaker for most real ta- retailers um, it's just a lot of noise yes, and there's no way to escape it except for that the Lord lifts us up yes, and you know the Lord knew that we were going to live in this day and hour he knew all the troubles and problems that we were going to face he knew about the elections and the pandemics and the the vaccines and everything there's there's nothing that's surprising him and his thoughts for us are good they're they're for peace and not of evil i love verse five it says many O lord my god are thy wonderful works which thou hast done and thy thoughts which are to usward i mean i know i've said it before and it this time of year, it seems, when it's cold, I just can't walk outside at night and look up at the stars on a clear night, and it takes my breath away. I, I often think of this scripture, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works, which thou hast done. You can't, with, with just kind of a clear mind, you can't walk out and look at the heavens and all of those stars and how amazing it is and not think of God. I mean, how many times, but, but the scripture says, and thy thoughts which are to usward. That the same God that created all of that, the same God that put this scripture in the Bible, I know my thoughts towards you, that he has many wonderful works and thoughts to us. It says, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And we know that Jesus came and walked and fulfilled all of the law that was written but also that I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, that, that that's, the, that's the cry of the bride as well. That, you know, your laws are written in my heart. It's not laws on a tablet of stone that I have to read and come bow down to every Sunday morning and Wednesday night and then go live the best I can at it. But I delight to do thy will. The groom that draws us, we... We, we, we have his laws written in our heart. And Hebrews echoes that scripture a little bit. Um, Hebrews 10. Paul references that here. Writings for he says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body... Hast thou prepared me? In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, so all that was done according to the law, all that was done according to the word of God. Then said I, lo, I come, in thy, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. 
By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the thoughts of God were always for the Lamb that would come and take away the sins of the world. Again, the thoughts of God are for taking us back to Eden. The thoughts of God were for Jesus Christ to come and manifest all the law and to walk in, 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 in the will of God and then bring the sacrifice that would allow God to send the Holy Ghost and have preeminence in his bride to bring us back to Eden. I mean, it's just the thoughts of God were always for Eden. And we, there was an Eden, but the thoughts of God, he knew what would happen because... The only way he could get us back to Eden is sons and daughters who loved him the way that he wanted us to love him. That song of Solomon, that drawing, that bride and the groom, we couldn't know our bridegroom if we didn't know him as a savior and a redeemer and a healer and all these things. The only way that we could know that, the only way that we could experience that was for everything to happen that's happened. Call it the fall if you want, but... It's all in the thoughts of God to give us peace and an expected end. Evil came about, but God's intentions for us are not for evil. Evil comes against us, but if we're in the eternal thoughts of God, what is a little evil? You know, I'm reading that book, the book Pilgrim's Progress. It's written in two parts, and the first part is about Christian, and he goes on the journey and makes it to heaven and then his wife and children decide to go on pilgrimage as well and you know i i read that and i can't remember when i read that but it was many years ago and part of it is i i I think i still needed to to know the lord more but i read the book and didn't have understanding but part of it's just experience you know you tack on 10 years and things look different than they did 10 years previous, maybe 15 or 20 years, but we'll not go into that. But, you know, you you read that book, and they're always coming up against something, and it seems like evil's always coming against them, but there's always a help. There's always deliverance. And even, you know, in the story, Christian picks up this one friend in the the city of fair, the fair, the city of the fair or something, and that friend does get killed, but he just goes straight to the city like christians on pilgrimage to go to the city and he meets this friend and they have christian fellowship and they walk along together for a time and then they get i think captured or something happens and his friend gets killed and his friend just goes straight to the city like there's no there's no evil there's no bad it's just you either go there by following this path or you may give your life but then you Sorry, I should have known that was going to happen. But then you go to the city. There's no evil. There, there's only peace. It's the, it's the thoughts of the Lord. And, and even with, um, in the second part, when it just kind of stood out to me, but when, you know, Christian's wife, Christi- Christiana, um, and then her friend Mercy, who was just the neighbor, and the children, the, the boys, they're going along and, they, they come to one of these houses along the way that's for pilgrims. And, and as, as they're approaching the house, or, or just after they leave the house, they encounter some danger and they, they cry out for help and, and the household sends someone to deliver them. And, and then he has to go back and he tells them, he said, well, you should have asked for someone to go with you along the whole way and you would have had a... Because they're just two women and children. You know, Christian, he carries a sword, and he, he has battles and fights and gets put to it. But these are just two women and children. And, and the, Mr. Greatheart tells him, he says, well, you should have just asked the master of the house to send you a guide. And he would have protected you the whole way. And so when they go to the, when they make the next stage of the journey and come to the next house, they ask. She says, you know, can we, can we have a guide to go with us and protect us? And he sent to go along with them. But he says that, you, and, the, and the, didn't Jesus say that in the Bible? You, you have not because you ask not. It's told unto her, you know, you're just a couple of women and children. Ask for help and it'll be sent to you. But you have to ask. It's not always just given to you in your, in your hand. 
So back to Hebrews, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. You know, all those bulls and goats and all of those offerings, the turtle doves and all those things. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, or forever sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If that's not the thoughts of God, perfection, that, that's only in him. We couldn't be perfected with, without him, without his sacrifice. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. You know, that the law of God, it's, it's more than commandments written down. It's more, than, it's more even than, than the, the ink typed on these pages, but... The laws of God, they're, to, the, to the believer, they're, they're written in our hearts. It's, it's not that I have to do thy will, O Lord, but I want to do thy will, O Lord. I am drawn to thee. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now back in our verse, in our psalm, in Psalm 40, I, I just love this, this chapter, but it says, Without not thou, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. And I love verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. His thoughts for us, for peace, not of evil. To give us an expected end. You know, the, the psalm here is written, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And on one side of that, you're, you know, your heart's crying out, You know, Lord, help me. You know, Lord, please, you know, withhold not thy tender mercies and innumerable evils and iniquities and all these things. Be pleased, O Lord, to help me. Or be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. But if you think about Jeremiah where he says, I know my thoughts toward you. He wants to deliver us. He wants to help us. His thoughts are for us to call out to him. So that he can come, deliver us, and help yeah. us. Yeah. You know, his word is written, I know my thoughts towards you. Thoughts for peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And then by his spirit, he draws us. He draws us like a bride to a groom. And we cry out, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Of course he's pleased to deliver us. He's the Lord God who has, the, has us in his thoughts and gave us the drawing power to draw to him, to cry out to him, O oh Lord, deliver me. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. I've always liked the book of Joshua. I think most of us do. In Joshua, the third chapter, the, the, the children of Israel, they've, they've conquered Jericho. And it says, And Joshua rose up, and Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. 
Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And, and in Schofield there, yet there shall be a space between you that references back in Hebrews the 10th chapter. The 19th verse, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. So Paul was writing here just before about the priests that continually offered the blood sacrifices of bulls and goats and animals, but this one who came and sacrificed one time and sat down at the right hand of God, Jesus, who paid the price for our redemption by the veil of his flesh, we have a new way typing there in Joshua that, you know, they, 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 they had the sacrifices, but now they were crossing over Jordan and there was a new way. They were coming into a new land. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So draw near unto God with a, with a true heart and full assurance of faith. You know... We've been talking, David's been preaching on the Song of Solomon and that, 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 that drawing of the, the groom to the bridegroom. And, and how can the believer not be as that bride drawn to her bridegroom, just so full of love, when you consider that he, he's told us he has thoughts for us that are for peace and not of evil. His thoughts are to give us an expected end, and that expected end isn't just, you know, a little bit of comfort here and plenty of food. He wants to take us to Eden. God's expected end, God's thoughts for us, is absolute perfection in paradise where we live forever. We can't even comprehend that. We can't even comprehend the thoughts of God. We can't even comprehend the expected end that he has for us. It's so great. And not only does he tell us, well, I have these thoughts for you to give you an expected end, but then he's the one that, I mean, he is that drawing power. I mean, how can you, how can you desire someone without that you have an attraction or desire? And he's telling us, I have these thoughts for you to bring you to this expected end and then I am going to draw you by my spirit. And then, I mean, it's not enough that he made, that, that he has Eden before us, perfection, paradise. And then he, 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 he draws us by his spirit. But then he has to make the way for us. He didn't just make the place and the drawing power but then he makes the way that we can even get there by coming. And Jesus Christ, once and for all, you know, all these priests that stand at the daily offering sacrifices, oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. You know, I, I like the good side of Christmas. The, the, the good side of, of love and family and, and togetherness and, and, you know, giving of gifts is even fine. But it's easy to get caught up in the mangers and the displays and the different things. A baby was born to a virgin, but that baby grew into a man and that man was Christ Jesus. And that man made one sacrifice for all. To bring us to the expected end that God has for us. And then he sat down on the right hand of the, of, of the Father. 
We're right at time, but I'll just read one thing. This is from the Healing Thoughts book. It says, Joshua said, gather the Israelites and up and down this river here, for you're going to see the glory of God. How are you going to get across the river? That's not my business. It's my business to walk down to the river. It's God's business to open it up when I get there. That's right. It's your business to testify and claim your healing. Say I'm healed. And it's God's business to take care of it after you testify and proclaim it. That's right. God gave you a dare to try it. So now, just take it. Find out whether it's right or not. I like that. Amen. God bless you.
welcome Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Sing it again. Just welcome him this morning. Oh, welcome Holy Spirit. of me.
and my hands were made to help my neighbor. My eyes were made to read God's word. My feet, my feet were made to walk in his footsteps. In his footsteps, my body is, is the temple of the Lord. Let's sing the chorus. Forgive me. For I was made in his likeness and created in his image for still human. I, I look at those verses and I think I know them and then I stumble over them. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 We're missing the McClards today. I believe Brother Matt's um, in quarantine. He was around a co-worker that had COVID, so they're not with us today. We miss them. And I know Dwight and Melissa, I believe they're traveling to Texas um, to get their daughter. So we miss those who aren't with us, but God's here this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't believe we have any we have any um, unspoken requests. Just raise your hand to the Lord. Brother Brad, would you come? It's good to have Brother Brad back in service with us. He had a, a scare this week, but it's good to have him back with us. Just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we just grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that we can gather together today. Lord, we pray for this service today. Lord, we pray that you'll come and be with us and bless us, dear Heavenly Father. Be with those that are streaming, Lord, and those that couldn't make it, Lord, those that are traveling, just give them traveling mercies, Lord, and just pray that you'll just receive our worship and our praise today, dear Heavenly Father. We just want to commit this service into your hands. We just thank you for it, and we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. It's Brother brother Matt's birthday today, so if you had a chance, might text him a happy birthday. He's 40 years old. And tomorrow's my 24th anniversary. So I know Sister Shelly passes out cookies. I think my wife might deserve a few cakes for putting up with me for, for that long. But I don't know if, if to you young people, it sure is a lot easier if you know the Lord, if you get a mate that, that loves the Lord, because we didn't know the Lord like we should have when we started out. And it's a lot easier when you're walking with the King. Amen. Let's sing Victory is Mine. Oh, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. And I told Satan to get thee behind, victory today is mine. When I rose this morning and when I rose, this morning I didn't have no doubt and I knew that the Lord would bring me out so I got down on my knees and I said Lord help me please and I rose up shouting victory oh victory Victory is mine, victory today is mine, I told Satan to get thee behind, victory today is mine, and Satan came this morning without even a warning. 
said, why don't you just quit or compromise? I said, listen here, old devil, with you I'm gonna level. I can't quit, my eyes are on the prize. And victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. I told Satan to get thee behind, victory. I've made my decision and my eyes have caught the vision of my heavenly bridegroom in the sky. So Satan, get behind me, for one day you won't find me. Victory is already mine. Victory is mine, victory today is mine. I told Satan to get thee behind, victory today is mine. Amen. Do you have the victory today? Amen. Brother Stephen and Steve, would you come for the morning offering? Stephen, would you bless the offering? Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings. Thank you again, Lord, for being in the house with the leaders of Life Church of Faith. Lord, we just pray that you would take the offering and be it used for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. You're ready to leave. I think we have now. Amen. Let's sing Ready to Leave in a twinkling of an eye. Some folks are building hopes down here and planning ahead. So busy with their fortunes, they forgot what Jesus said about the wars and earthquakes and the fig trees budding leaves. There's a group of people getting ready to leave, ready to leave in the twinkling of an eye, making investments in that bank up in the sky, happy preparations, not a reason to Spirit's calling, make your way to Calvary, and get in that number, getting ready to leave, ready to leave, in the twinkling of an eye, making investments in that bank up in the sky, happy not a reason to grieve. Are you in that number getting ready to leave? Amen. Sister Shelley, I believe has a song for us. Amen. It's good to have my sister and her children in town with us today. It's always good to have her back from Canada. She needs to just move back here, I believe. <laughs> A woman, a 
woman came to Simon's house. She knew the Lord was there. And when she walked into the room, she was greeted by the stairs. She surely must have shocked a few of the people gathered there. With tear-filled eyes and trembling hands, she took down her long, dark hair. From an alabaster vessel, precious ointment filled her hands. And as she wept, she kissed his feet and began anointing them. And with her hands, she was touching him. Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And with her hands, she was holding on to his. And the source of life was right there in her hand. Now Simon said within his heart, Lord, if you only knew the kind of woman that's touching you. But Jesus knew about her past. He knew about the sin. Yet he saw in her a repented heart that had come to worship him. And with her hands, she was touching him, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the was right there in her hands. Now tell me why have we gathered together in his name? Are we like the ones who merely watched? Tell me, is that why we came? Or are we like this sister do we truly enter in, in spirit and in truth? Have we come to worship him? And with your hands, are you touching him? And with your heart, are you loving is right there in your hands. With your hands, are you touching him? The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And with your hands, are you holding on? His, then the source of life, it's right there in your hands. Then the source of life, it's right there in your hands. Amen. Amen. Hannah, it's good to have you here. I didn't mean to leave you out either. It's good to have Anna Avery here with us. Amen. Let's sing. Um, I will praise the Lord. 
Well, I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. No matter what tomorrow brings, what it has.
Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we uh, transition into the Word. First, just want to wish Brother Matt a happy birthday and uh, hate that um, I, I wasn't able to, to go to his, his party last night. Just felt that it was better for me to, to not go, but um, certainly appreciate Brother Matt. He's just a wonderful brother and friend and um, you, you know, I, I wasn't supposed to be preaching this morning. It's supposed to be Brother Brian Hawkins preaching for us this morning, but unfortunately, Brother Brian had also been exposed to somebody who's sick and expected uh, and suspected to have coronavirus. So I asked them all to, to to quarantine, and I mean, they were happy to do it and would have probably done it anyway. But nonetheless, I, I hated hated that I had asked Brother Brian to not preach after I'd already told him, hey, come on and preach for us. And so we'll uh, we appreciate Brother Brian. I'll try to get with him and get him to to come back maybe next month or, or, or sometime when it when it works out, get him to come back and preach for us because we certainly appreciate our, our brother. And, you know, just uh, I, I just I hate the world that we live in right now. I, I hate this coronavirus. I, I hate it's just a, a devil behind the coronavirus. It's a stupid devil. It's a stupid disease. But, you know, unfortunately, people prove every day that stupid's very real and it's something we have to account for and deal with. Um, and so, you, you know, I just uh, wanted to remind everybody, let, let's exercise some prudence. Um, be, be mindful of your decisions uh, that, you know, I... I, I uh, Asking people to quarantine is not something I, I like to do. Church should be a place that you can invite somebody to come anytime, any any circumstances. And yet, unfortunately, the world that we live in right now, that means if somebody comes and they're sick, it, you possibly have to cancel church for two weeks or go to online only or uh, and to recognize that, uh, you know, it... Uh, uh, I'm already low or I'm actually out of PTO the last wave that just came through the church. I actually didn't have all the PTO I needed for the time I took off. My manager was gracious and said not to worry about it, and I thank the Lord for that. I think it was going to be more trouble for him to figure out how to handle that than it was worth the, the uh, I think it was two extra days I, I missed or something like that. But uh, nonetheless, it not everybody has that, that benefit. Some people, if they're not working, they're not getting a paycheck. And and, you know, uh, some, some companies have coronavirus pay and some don't. And it, it's, it's the world we live in. And so, you know, the decisions we make don't just impact our lives. It's one thing to say, no, I want to go and uh, I should be able to do this. I've got this right. And it's true, you do. But our decisions affect others, too. And you know, this coronavirus just makes it a little more obvious. So, you, you know... Uh, uh, again, if you've been around somebody that you know who is sick and likely has coronavirus, I ask you to please go ahead and quarantine. We do have the streaming now. Uh, it's, it's not as good. It's not the same. I, I, I know that. I, I'd much rather be here in person. It's, it's different. But if you know you've been around somebody who's sick, um, likely has it, please, please quarantine. But if you've just been around somebody who they have been exposed. I, I'm not asking you to quarantine in that scenario. Um, you, you don't actually know anything in that scenario. So uh, I, I don't want us living in fear. I don't want us reacting out of fear. Just um, uh, try to use uh, sound judgment and um, that sort of thing. So just just be mindful of, of decisions and the potential consequences. So uh, this morning uh, or today we are just going to have one service um, so no service this evening, uh, uh, dismissing service this evening. I am still looking for uh, Brother Ben Norod to come and, and preach for us on the 27th, um, looking for two services there. So uh, keep that service in your prayer. Hopefully that all works out. But if he gets exposed to coronavirus, then um, we'll probably have to reschedule him as well. And, you know, we'll play that by ear. At, we're, we're right in the time frame now also of... Uh, you know, the Christmas holidays coming up. I know a lot of us have family get-togethers, and I know a lot of us had an abnormal Thanksgiving that we often get together with, and it was not right. It just it didn't feel right. It, it It's not right. I, I'm hopeful that 
we can we're praying that we stay healthy and can still get together with family and friends at, at Christmas. I'm not trying to advocate not getting together or not. We've all got lives to live. We have to live our lives. We still got to go to work. Kids still got to go to school. We can't stop living our lives because of this disease or, or sickness. But at the same time, it does affect how we live our lives. It does affect how we make decisions. So um, just keep that in mind. We, we got to stay vigilant. And, and you know, it's, uh, you, you know, I, I was just thinking that uh, just like we got to stay vigilant against this coronavirus, it, it, it's not, I, I know they've announced a vaccine, but it's going to be middle of next year before it's able to do much good, it sounds like, so, or there's even enough of it to, to go around. But uh, nonetheless, we, we, so we, we got to stay on our guard at that time, but that's just coronavirus, one sickness. The reality is, as Christians, we've got to be vigilant against the devil in all aspects every day. I mean, coronavirus, you get sick. I, I mean... We, we've got a promise the Lord's going to heal us. That we get sick, but, you know, the devil, he's, he's not after just making your body sick. He's after your soul. And we, we've got to be uh, just as much or more vigilant against the devil every day, every decision we make, how we live our lives. We've got to, because the, the devil doesn't just give up. He doesn't just, oh, yeah, they, they've accepted the message. <laughs> I guess I've lost that battle. I, I better, let's, let's move on. He, he doesn't just give up. He stays at you. He, you know, he may give you a little bit of a break, let you get a little overconfident, and then he's still right there. He's still setting up the next trap that, you know, we, we got to stay vigilant against him. But, you know, we serve a God who's greater than the devil. We serve a God who's, who's greater than any trap that he can set or any snare that he can lay for us that, you know, if we just walk with the Lord and stay close to him, that he will lead us and guide us. Amen. So uh, just wanted to um, announce that. If you ever have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. That's, that's, that's fine. So um, let's turn on our Bibles this morning to Song of Solomon. We'll continue our, our uh, thought here, or our subject of drawing power this morning. But Song of Solomon, chapter 1. So again, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We'll also be reading in St. John this morning as well. So Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and we'll read verse 1, or start with verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. The song of songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. And let's turn to St. John chapter 12 this morning, if we would. St. John chapter 12, there's several scriptures I want to pick up here. St. John chapter 12, we'll start with verse 17. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for they that heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, this world has gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, 
there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said, It thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, while ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer this morning. Dear Lord Jesus. Father, we love you, Lord God. Lord, and we recognize that we're, we're living at the end time, Lord God. It's a, it's a dark hour that we're living in, Lord God. But Father, we're thankful for the light that you're shining forth in this hour, Lord God. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that, that you've opened our eyes that we can see it, Lord God. May you just come this morning, Lord Jesus. Father, speak to each heart, Lord God. May your word be quickened to us, Lord God. Lord, not just an intellectual understanding that we can explain to somebody else, Lord, but a, a living reality in our lives, Lord Jesus. That's what we have need of, Lord God. Father, may you just move amongst us, Lord God. We're a needy people, Lord God. Lord, may you just move in our midst, Lord God. Speak to each and every need, Lord God, and each and every heart. We just commit all things now to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated this evening. This morning, I know what time it is. But continuing our thought on, on drawing power and, again, just, just looking at the, the Scripture, the hour that we're living in and, and this gospel, but, but looking at it through the, the lens of Song of Solomon, I, I'm still just uh, rejoicing and, and feasting on, on this book, A Song of Solomon. I, I think I read through the entire book at least once, if not multiple times a week right now. It's just, uh, it, it's just a, a, a precious book right now. I, I've never quite, quite seen it like, like this before. I've read it before, but, uh, you know, the, the Lord's just been uh, good uh, and, and seems to be revealing it to me, but to recognize that this is being lived, lived out right amongst us, that, that this, this Song of Solomon, it, it's... It, it's a it's a book of poetry. It's it's, it's a song, and, and and you know we we've we've probably all uh, seen musicals before where where there there's different characters singing a song during this musical, and and you know that at one point one character sings a song and uh, or sings a verse, and then somebody else sings a verse, and maybe they come together for a chorus, and and maybe there's another point in the song where where each character has their part that they're singing, but they sing it at the same time. And, and, and because you're, you're uh, familiar with the story, because you've been listening the whole time, that, that even though the words that they're singing might be different, they go together and you're hearing both, both parts at the same time to, to, to hear one message. It, there, it, it might be coming through through different words or or, or, or different different key, not different keys but but different one person higher one person lower but but it's one message and it's all the more powerful for it because you've heard the one part you've heard the other part you you've heard a chorus you then you hear them coming together and you hear them singing together in unison and, and maybe it's different parts but then again they, they go into a chorus and both of them singing the same thing at the same time and it makes for a, a powerful experience when you're listening to it 
And, and that's what's going on in this, this Song of Solomon. It, it's not just a single voice coming through Scripture. A, a lot of times you, we, we read a, a book of the Bible and it's, it's, it's one voice or, or you know one, one, one perspective that, that you're getting. And it's great and it's wonderful and it's powerful. But, but Song of Solomon, to, to really receive everything that's there, you've got to be able to recognize the different voices and the different parts being sung out. And, and, and recognizing that, that we have our part to sing. We, we've got our part to live out. And God's living out His part. We've got our part to live out. And then, then you know, at various points through the, through the book, there, there are even others that, that have their voice to play. And to recognize that, that, that God's got this great big plan of redemption. And, and, and you know, he, the, the whole point, the, the, the culmination of everything, that it's not just God and God alone, but it's God wanting fellowship. It's God having fellowship with a, with a bride, somebody that is, is just like him, the same nature, the, the same character. And, and they're, they're different voices. You've got the bridegroom and you've got the bride, each singing their part through, throughout this book. But then it comes together at the end. They're both saying the same thing, that the, both the spirit and the bride are saying come. That, that, that we have our part to sing, it's, it's the same, same spirit, the, the, the same word, the, the same life that Jesus lived is the life that the bride is living out today. It's not a, a different life, it's not a, a different set of characteristics, it's not a different nature, it's the same life, the same voice, the same word. And you know, uh, the... And, 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 you know, we, we started this, that, that the book starts out with the, the bride singing and she says, draw me and we'll run after thee. That, that you know, it, it's not just, you know, you start, the draw, you start drawing me, you, you kind of start the relationship and I'm just going to take off running. I mean, you, you ever seen a, a little kid get so excited to do something or go somewhere that they just take off running and they don't even know where they're going or what they're doing yet? And, you know, a few seconds later they have to come back, what, what, what was it I was supposed to do? What was it? Where was I supposed to go? That, you know, that, that sometimes I think as Christians that that happens, that, that you can get so excited, you get so enthused in yourself, you take off, you start jumping, you start jancing, you start rejoicing, that, and then it's like, oh, wait a second, what, what was the word that was coming forth? What was the, what was the message that was really being preached? What, what was I really supposed to be receiving? I, I just got so into the song, and we should get into the song service. We should express ourselves. Uh, sometimes, it, and I know I fight this in my own natural nature, I, I'm just not a very expressive person in the first place. It's not that I don't feel emotions. It's not that I don't have reactions. It's just that whatever connects those emotions or reactions to facial or physical expressions that doesn't always connect in me. My wife's the exact opposite. You, you always know what she's thinking. It comes across on her face. I'm not that way. And yet we all have to express our, our love for, for Christ. We all have to, there should be an enthusiasm with the Christian experience that, that you know, if, if you never do anything about this relationship that you say you have with the Lord, if it, if it never moves you into action, if it, if it never gives you joy, if it never causes any emotion in your life whatsoever, I'm saying, wait a second. Do you really have what you're claiming to have? Because with, when you have the reality of the life of Christ in your life, when he's actually dwelling on the inside, he will move you into action. That, that you know, it, it, it manifests itself a, a little bit different in each person. I'm not saying we all got to react the same way. I'm not saying we all got to dance in the same way or speak in tongues in the same. He manifests himself in a, a, a variety of ways. But if he's there, he will manifest himself in your life. And to, to, to recognize that, that, you know, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. And, and here in the, 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 the book of John that, that we see that Jesus, he, he, he's coming up to the end of, 
of uh, you know his his mortal life here on on earth his his, his life and he's coming up to to Calvary he he's in the the last week they're gathering in Jerusalem for the for the Passover feast that, 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 that's what's kind of the the stage of the background he's just come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey where they've been uh, running before him with the uh, palm leaves in their hand shouting Hosanna and throwing them on the ground for for him to to come in on this has just happened the the Pharisees they're not happy about it and you know that that you know the Pharisees are so caught up in their their own religion and and their own righteousness that they can't receive anything Jesus has that you know that they've seen the same life that the disciples have seen but they can't see Jesus for who he is and, and to to recognize that that you know and the, the there's people are are coming for coming to see Jesus for themselves because of the testimony of Lazarus and, you know, Lazarus' testimony, we know he was in the grave four days. This wasn't some mistaken diagnosis by the doctor that, you know, oh, he's, he's dead and, you know, he starts moving. It, it, it was, this was not a mistaken diagnosis. Four days in the grave. And Jesus, with just his voice, calls him forth. And he comes back to life. It's a powerful testimony that Lazarus has. And, and because of the testimony of Lazarus, many people gather and come to, to see and hear Jesus, to hear what he teaches. And they're recognizing Jesus has a different ministry than, than most of the Pharisees or Sadducees that they've heard. That He's got a different kind of ministry than, than most people who speak in the synagogue each week. And, and we find that, that many are gathering so much so that the Pharisees, are, they're so against it that they're, even, they're not just saying, hey, we need to get rid of this Jesus guy. They're even saying, hey, I, I think we might need to get rid of Lazarus as well. His testimony is so powerful that they're, they're turning away uh, people from, from uh, they're, they're, he's turning so many people to, to Jesus. I think we got to get rid of him too. That that was the power of the testimony that Lazarus had. What's the devil saying about your testimony this morning? What's the devil saying about the testimony that you're living out on a regular basis? Is he saying, oh, no, just leave him be. He's actually helping me more than, yeah, he goes to church, but everybody sees the life he lives outside of church. He's doing more for me than, than you know, the 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 the... Uh, busiest bar downtown. He, he's doing, what's the devil saying about your testimony this morning? Is he saying, wait a second, no, they've got way too powerful of a testimony. There's a, a life behind that testimony. I've got to do something about that. I can't just let that be. And we find that, that you know, Lazarus, he's got this testimony. And, and these Greeks here about this testimony, these Greeks They've actually gathered in Jerusalem for the, for the Passover feast themselves to worship. It says they've actually gathered to worship at the feast. Now, I, I, I've always historically pictured these Greeks as being Gentiles. I, I actually don't know if they were Gentiles. I, uh, I realize that, you know, there were many Jews dispersed at this time, that these could have been Jews um, that, that lived outside of um, outside of Israel or, or Jerusalem at this time, that they could have been Jews, just like the, the wise men uh, were, were likely Jews or at least studied under Daniel that came and, and, and whatnot. But, but these Greeks, whether they were Jews, whether they were Gentiles, I, I don't know, but they, they already recognized there was something significant about the God of Israel. They, they already recognized that, and they, they had gathered to, to worship at this Feast of Passover because it was a, a, a key feast of worship, an important feast of worship to them, that uh, God had commanded them to, to keep that as a memorial every year. That, and they, they, they had gathered, and, and, and they came up to Philip and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. That they came up, they, they had the right respect. There was a genuine interest in their heart that, that hey, there, there's something different about this. They, they'd gathered to worship the God of Israel at the Feast of Passover, but there's something special about this Jesus, that, that He's not a different God, but He's the same God. He's the embodiment of the life of God, this great God that we've heard. 
This great God who brought Israel out of Egypt and did away with the Egyptian army, who, who brought them out with a mighty hand. The, the, same, the same God who established David as his king over Israel and Solomon after him and, and all the nations had to respect the same God and the same might and power that he showed then during that time we see embodied in one man in this Lord Jesus Christ. We've heard about this man. We would see him for ourselves. And not just see him from a distance, but we want to see and talk with him. We, we, we want to uh, understand him. And, and, and you know, Philip, he doesn't quite know what to do. He goes and he gets Andrew. Andrew doesn't quite know what to do. So they both, they go get Jesus and Jesus talks to them. It says, except a corn of wheat fall into a ground and die, it abideth alone. Now, I, I, I don't know what the Greeks were expecting, but it probably wasn't the message that they heard preached. Uh, wait a second, Jesus. What, go back to that Lazarus come forth. That was some good stuff. Why don't you preach that message again? I, I, I'd like to hear that one from myself. What is this except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and dieth, abideth alone? If you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you hate your life in this world for my sake... You're going to gain life eternal. But uh, wait a second, Jesus. I, I, I was looking for, you know, how to select the best lamb for sacrifice. You know, I, the sacrifice is great as long some other lamb, something that's not me. That's a fine sacrifice. Why don't you tell me how to, to find that sacrifice better? Or, you, you know, maybe a way to direct a portion of my money. I, I don't really want it affecting my life, Jesus. I, I, after all, I've got a life. You know, I've got my priorities. I want to worship God. I want to be a good Christian. But Lord, don't change my life. But Jesus is saying, if you want to keep it unto life eternal, you have to hate your life in this world. That there's a death that has to come. And, and, you know, Jesus, even as a man, he's saying, my soul's troubled. I, I recognize this is coming. My death is here. It's at the doorstep. This is why I came into the world, to suffer. I, I recognize this is the role God has called me to fulfill. It's not going to be pleasant for this earthly flesh. But he's called me this, that God would glorify himself, that God would receive the glory. And Jesus is saying, this is what's most important. It says, Father, glorify thy name. And they hear a voice from heaven. And the voice says, I have glorified it. You're already, uh, your life already glorifies the, the name of the Lord that you are so surrendered to, to the, the, the will, that you are so surrendered that you've not lived your life unto yourself. That you, you've, you've given up everything, all the rights that you had as a human, all the rights that you had as a Jew, all the rights that you had as a man, you've given them up. That you could walk in my will and do what I've called you to do. And it's not been easy. But because you've given that up, because you've chosen the harder way, there has been a glory come through your life. <coughs> but the voice doesn't stop there. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. That, that you know that, that Jesus, that this voice is saying, Jesus, that you're great. You've done everything I've asked you to do. You're, you're already on the right road. You're walking the right path. I see the, uh, as a man, I, I see your heart and that you're committed to this path. And the hardest is yet to come, but I know you're going to go through it. You've been called for this purpose. And Jesus says, this voice wasn't for me. This voice was for you. God saying He's going to glorify the name again, that's not for my benefit. That's for your benefit. And then He announces, the judgment has come. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up. 
Now, he's not talking about being lifted up on, on his ascension. He's talking about being lifted up on the cross. He's talking about the ultimate death. I will draw all men unto me. That through this lifting, through this sacrifice, there's a drawing power going to be unleashed on the world. That the name of God would be glorified again. That the, the corn of wheat has to die. That much fruit ha- can come forth. That Jesus had to die on the cross. That his life could then be unleashed on you and I here this morning. That it could be poured out on you and I here this morning. But you know, it, I don't know how many times Brother Brandon preached the, the message, Sir, we would see Jesus. It, it was a lot. He, he preached it a lot. And uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I was listening to um, a time and it just struck me different. I don't know how I... Sometimes I listen to a message and wonder if I've ever heard Brother Brandon preach it before, even though I know I'm listening to it for the umpteenth time. But, but he goes, you know, these Greeks came and said, sir, we would see Jesus. He goes, now, the scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you're looking for Jesus this morning, what are you looking for? And just, just the way Brother Branham phrased it, it, it stopped me and go. And I was asking, am I looking for, am I even looking for Jesus? I mean, if we're not careful, Jesus becomes just a historical Jesus. Oh, sure, the Greeks were looking for him, but he, he died. Sure, he rose again, but he's way up in heaven off away somewhere. Well, why would you look for him this morning? Well, you would look for him because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That, that you know, but what are you looking for this morning? All right, what, the, and to, to recognize that, that many people were, were looking for Jesus. Many people were looking for the Messiah. And they were struggling to see him, even though he's standing right in front of them. That they, you know, Jesus says this, and the, the, the people, they're, they're hearing the message Jesus is preaching, saying, wait a second, we know about this Christ. We know about this Messiah. Scripture says he's going to abide with us forever. What do you mean you're going to die? I've been hearing the message. I've been hearing it preached. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Uh, you can't die. Scripture says he abides forever. If you're dying, you can't be the Christ. They were taking their intellectual understanding of the scripture and trying to force it on what was living right in front of them. And because of it, they couldn't see Jesus for who he was. And many people ended up turning away and and not recognized, even though they heard the testimony of Lazarus, even though they saw Jesus and heard him preach themselves, even though in the middle of of Jesus' message, they hear a voice from heaven and and some just heard a thunder, some heard an angel speaking, even though they saw and experienced all this, they didn't recognize Jesus being the Messiah, even though he was right in front of them. Not everyone can see him. That's why Jesus told the the disciples, um, blessed are your eyes because you can see. Blessed are your ears because you can hear. Let's turn over to John 16 this morning. John 16 and verse 12. It says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this 
that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father? They said, Therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. Because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world again. I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now that speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus, he's saying quite a bit here. But he's saying, ye shall see me. Ye shall see me. That, that you know that there, there's a lot of people in this world looking for Jesus and won't be able to see him. Though he's right in front of them. But there's also a group of people that shall be able to see him. That can say, sir, we would see Jesus. And because they're looking for the right thing, because they've heard the right message and have received the right message, they know what they're looking for. That they can see Jesus moving in the hour that, that we don't, we're not uh, living for or serving or, or loving a historical Jesus this morning. We're not just looking at a Jesus who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, but that same Jesus is moving in this hour. He's being revealed in this hour, but to be revealed for that, for that revelation to come forth, for that, for that glory to happen, for the glorifying of that name to happen again, it requires a death. Yes, it required a death 2,000 years ago at Calvary, but it requires your death this morning. That Paul said, I beseech you therefore, present your bodies a living sacrifice. That you can't come to this Jesus. You can't have the right sacrifice and have it not change your life. That we're not just looking for uh, another place to funnel some money. We're not just looking for uh, another, uh, the right kind of lamb to select. That we can offer a, a lamb, pay a little bit of money, and go on our way living however we want to. But it requires a death to ourselves. It requires a giving up of, of our desires, our wants. That, that as humans, we have certain rights. As Americans, we have certain rights. As men and women, we have certain rights. But you lay them down that the will of God can be fulfilled in your life. Jesus didn't even have his own house to live in. He didn't have a, a, a family of his own. He, did, he didn't take a wife. He, he didn't have kids because that wasn't the role God called for him to to, to live, that, that you know he was called to lay down his life. You and I, God has called for us to live a life. And it's probably different 
than what we would choose for ourselves. Because the life that He's called us to, it's a life of tribulation. I would love to stand up here this morning and tell you that, you know, oh, the Christian life, it's just wonderful, there's no... No suffering, it's just power, it's just peace, it's just... I would love to be able to tell you that. But a Christian life, they're suffering. And let's, let's be honest, as Americans, as the, the, the country that we live in, most of us don't even really know what suffering is. I mean, most of us suffering, I've got to drive a car that's 10 years old or older. Oh my goodness, I, I, I can't even afford a new car. I'd much rather drive a new car, but i got to drive this, this old car, 10 years old. You know, we, we can't remodel our house quite as quickly as we'd like to. i got to do it. Man, i, I got a nice warm house to live in, but I really want to fix it up and do this, and I, I just can't do Oh, the suffering I've got to go through. The indoor plumbing I have isn't quite as nice to use as I would like to. If you can't tell, we've got bathroom remodeling on our mind in our household. You know, it. oh, I, I, I got to eat leftovers this evening rather than go out to eat. Man, suffering. Whew. You know, I, 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 I sometimes get weary at just working a full-time job and then uh, preaching multiple times a week. At, you know, sometimes it wears on me and I get to... Uh, feeling weary and wondering, and that man, I was reading this morning, and uh, brother talking about Iranian pastors over in Turkey. There's a bunch of Iranian refugees in Turkey, and and uh, the pastors over there have to work 12 to 14 hour days, six days a week. Sunday's the only day, and it's hard labor. <laughs> I don't work hard labor. I, I I sit in a chair and type on a keyboard. It is not hard labor. Or, uh, you know, talk on a, a video call or something. There is nothing laborious about my work at all. But, but you know, over there, it's hard labor, 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. And the, the one, one day that they get off is the day they then have to preach and, and pastor their congregation. And that 12 to 14 hours a day, that's it, all they can do to keep food on the table for them and their families. And I'm saying, uh, you know, I got it pretty good. I mean, my job is very flexible on my time. I, I can flex it as needed as long as I'm getting my work done. They don't really care. I, I got nothing to complain about this morning. I don't really know what suffering is. That, you know, it, uh, there, 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 there are countries that, and churches where they don't even have enough Bibles for everybody. I mean, can you imagine this morning if, if there was only five Bibles for everybody here? As far as actual Bibles, that, if we had to trade and read, okay, well, you can, you can take it home this re- week and read. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for my turn to come around again next. What, what if there was only five Bibles? I've got five Bibles all by myself. And one of them has four different translations in it. And that's besides what I've got on my tablet or my phone. That's besides what my wife has. That's besides what my kids have. I'm not struggling to read the Word of God. Or if I am struggling, it's not because it's not available for me to read. That we don't understand how good we've got it a lot of times. That that we think we're suffering. We don't really know what suffering is. There there are countries that that they can't get message books to read. They, They can't listen to the message in their own language. They can't read the, that, that, you know, it's, you can say, oh, well, it's online. If they, they just got to log online and they can read it in their own language. But there's a lot of countries that they don't have the, the power supply to even charge a tablet if they had one. That we could buy one for everybody in the country and they couldn't use it because they couldn't keep it charged. And even if they could keep it charged, the Internet's not available for them to even connect online and read it for themselves. They don't have the hard copies. Of, we've got so many extra copies of, of message books and whatnot that, you know, a lot of us have gone to reading it on our tablets or phone or we don't even hardly pick up a hard copy of a message book anymore. And there are countries starved for the message to be able to read it for themselves. That the only thing they get is what their pastor preaches in church on the weekend. But we think we have it rough and suffer. 
that, you know, we, we, we say we, we care for the poor. Jesus came. He lived his life for others. He came and he, he spent time with the, the publicans and, and those who were looked down on. The, those who, he spent time with the poor, ministering to them, helping them out. We say we have the same life. We say we care. And yet, how much of our money goes to help those overseas? How much of our money goes to help spread the gospel? We, we find a way to pay for that coffee through the drive through or we, we find a way to... And I'm not condemning having comforts or, or going out to eat. I'm not trying to condemn that at all. But how much do we really care? How, how much does that love really put us into action? Or do we just say, wow, yeah, I'm glad I don't live over there. Man, they really have it rough. I, I, I'll say an extra prayer for them. And yet most of us have more money than, I mean, we find things to do with it, but we don't really need the things that we do with it. Not, not really. Not when I don't even have a Bible to read on their own. How good do we have it this morning? How, how good do we have it this morning that, that you know, a, a lot of churches, if they have to close due to sickness or coronavirus or whatever, they don't have the ability to stream a service. They can't have virtual services. It's not an option for them. And yet we can even do that. We've got it good this morning. We've been blessed. And if that life of Jesus is in us, it should move us to care for and help those less fortunate than ourselves. And yet, how often does it? These Greeks say, sir, we would see Jesus. If somebody showed up at the church doorstep this morning and said that same thing. What if they approached you this morning? Said, sir, ma'am, we would see Jesus. What would you do? How would you respond? If he's the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever, he can be found this morning. He can be seen this morning. If he's the same Jesus, it, it's not a, oh, well, you got to get a time machine and go back 2,000 years ago. Or, you know, if you just hold out just a little bit longer, there's going to be a rapture and then a tribulation. And then Jesus is going to come back again. But it, is that all you can tell him this morning? Or can Jesus be seen through your life this morning? You see, that, that same life should be living out through you. The, the, the name of God should be glorified through your life, the life that you're living because you're so surrendered to His will that you've died out to yourself. But as long as your will is in control, as long as your desires are the driving force behind your actions and your decisions, Jesus can't be glorified in your life. You might be glorified. But the name of Jesus won't be glorified in your life. It's the same spirit moving this morning. But it takes a death. It takes a death to self. It takes you recognizing that, that Jesus took your place on the cross. But, but you, you know, you've got to die to yourself. You've got to have your same Calvary experience that Jesus had. That you've got, just like Jesus died in the... Garden of Gethsemane, Brother Branham said he died more in Gethsemane than he did on the cross because he was dying out to his last desire. The, the last thing that was part of him as a man fighting the will of God, he died out to that in the Garden of Gethsemane. That if you come to that same surrender to God, Jesus is lifted up and that same death to self is seen in your life the name of Jesus will be glorified through the life that you live. It's not going to be a bed of roses. It's not going to be easy. But for the name to be glorified again, that's what needs to happen. Let's turn to Song of Solomon chapter 5. So Song of Solomon chapter 5, we've, we've already seen the kind of the back and forth between the the, the, the bride and the groom a, a couple times. Chapter 3, the, uh, you know, Solomon arrives and, and, and majesty and glory shows up for the wedding ceremony. Chapter 4, that, that wedding ceremony ta takes place. Then we come to chapter 5. 
Let's start with verse 2. This is the bride speaking now. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn to himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. What is, and this is the daughters of Jerusalem speaking. They say, What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? We have here an, an interesting portion of this, this song of songs that, that, you know, that chapter 4, that there's a, a marriage that takes place, but then the bride finds herself in her room alone. She thinks she's okay. She thinks she's good to go. She's got the right garments, but she doesn't have them on. And when her beloved shows up knocking at her door, she realizes she's not ready. It's, it's, a, it's nighttime, it's a time of sleep, she, she, she's, she's trying to sleep, and she, she wakes up, and she recognizes she's not ready. Her beloved at the door, and she can't even open to him to have fellowship with him, because she's not ready. She doesn't have her garments on. That, that you know, she, she's got the, the myrrh, she's got the ointment and the oil, but she doesn't have it on, she's not ready. And by the time she, she gets her garments on and gets to the door, he's done gone. She goes out looking for him because he's her beloved. It's what she lives for. It's the, the, the love for him is what drives her. And suddenly the watchmen of the city turn and attack her. The, uh, the, the, the veil, they, they, they take it away from her and they, they attack her. The keepers of the wall strike her down. And she doesn't say, oh, woe is me, what are you doing? Don't you know what your job is? You're supposed to be watchmen on the wall, looking out, warning from, from dangers without coming toward the city. No. She's saying, have you seen my beloved? She's not worried about the attack she's under. She's not wor worried about the, the suffering that she's going through. All she can still think about is her beloved. And, and, and we find that the daughters of Jerusalem... They recognize there's something different about this bride. They, they, they see there's something different about her testimony. She shouldn't be reacting like she is. She's, she's calling out for her beloved. She's telling everybody who will listen, Hey, if you see my beloved, tell him, I still love him. I'm still living for him. I'm, si that I'm sick of love, meaning I can't even live a normal life anymore. The, the love has so affected me. I'm faint. I don't walk the same anymore. I don't talk the same anymore. The love has so affected and moving me. It's, it's like I have a sickness that I can't live the life that I used to live. And the daughters of Jerusalem, they're, they're looking at her going, that's not a normal reaction to getting beat down. That's not a normal reaction to the disgrace and the revilement you're going under right now. What is this? Just, just who is your beloved? Now, this is King Solomon. She, she's, she's married to King Solomon. King Solomon, whose reputation was so well-renowned that the Queen of the South heard about her all the way down in Africa. That she packed up and traveled just to see for herself if the rumors she heard were true. That, that, you know, here Solomon's right in their midst. Solomon has chosen this woman for his own. That, that she belongs to him. 
And there are people in the city going, who's your beloved? He's been right in their midst, right in their city, showed up at this woman's doorstep. And they don't have a clue who she is. They don't have a clue who he is. They have eyes, but they can't see. And so she starts telling him about her beloved, how good he is, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he's still a miracle-working God. He's still a God that answers prayer. He's a God that's living today just like he lived 2,000 years ago. That, that she starts telling him, starts telling this, this, she starts preaching the gospel to him. And suddenly they respond, hey, let's go find this guy. I'd like to see him for myself. That, that you know, it was her, her, her light shone all the brighter for the fact of the persecution she received at this nighttime. That, that you know, the, uh, the, this persecution, it came through watchmen. Kind of implies this is a, a religious persecution that she's going under. The, the watchmen are supposed to be the ministers of the gospel that are looking out and, and stay true to this word, preaching the dangers of anything contrary to this word. And yet they're turned and they're more focused on this one woman inside the city. That you know the, the, the churches of this world turned against this message, have come against this message. That they'd, they'd rather hold true to a, a trinity doctrine that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I, I still don't understand how that makes more sense than one God, one person. I, I don't understand it. I, I, I don't, I've read a couple things about it. it. I don't know how that makes more sense than the same God all down through time, the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. I don't understand it. But they would rather hold true to that, to their creeds, to what they've always preached, to their power, their influence. They'd rather hold true to that than recognize the living God right in front of them. And just like the Pharisees, they will turn against anybody who testifies or can direct people to the true Jesus, the true Messiah. That's the time that we're living in. But if anything, this persecution and the way she responded to it is what allowed her to minister to the other daughters of Jerusalem. We find that they all go then in search for her beloved. And that's, that's you know, we, we get and you get down to, to verse 10 of chapter 7 and, and the bride saying, I am my beloved and his desire is toward me. That... That yes, it was a, a nighttime, and yes, that, that you know, she found herself at a, in a position where she wasn't prepared, and she had to get ready. We've got a scripture that the bride makes herself ready. We read that Wednesday. That, that you know, it, you, you look at the parable of the, the five wise and the five foolish virgins, that, that you know, when that shout went forth, there weren't any of them ready. But there were five wise, they had the oil. But they still had to awake. They still had to trim their lamps. That they, they, they recognized that they'd let some things go in their life. They weren't quite ready to, to meet the, the, the bridegroom like they thought they were. They, weren't, they had to get up and they had to trim their lamps. They had, to, they had to search their lives by the scripture. They had to search their lives by the light of the word. Get rid of anything contrary. That, that it's not that they didn't have the word. It's not, it's not that they didn't have the right garments or the right thing. They had it all. They just weren't in position. They weren't ready. Then I urge you this morning, examine your lives. Make sure you're dressed right. Make sure your lamps are trimmed and clear. Make sure that the, the, the light of the life of Jesus is able to shine through your life clearly this morning there's the the world isn't necessarily going to recognize it for what it is the world isn't necessarily going to be able to to recognize it but they're going to recognize that you respond differently under pressure than normal people do they're going to resp- they're going to recognize that that you respond differently to to persecution and 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 suffering than normal people do that when when the devil comes against you with all that he has You're not even worried about that. You're just saying, where's my beloved? 
as long as I've got Jesus in my life, I'm okay. That, that you know, we, we talked about that, that transition that, that early on she's talking, my beloved is mine and I am his. But as she goes along and gets closer with him, it changes. It's no longer about what she has. I mean, I, I've had a lot of things in, in my life that I ended up losing. I've had a lot of things, you know... I, uh, my, my strength gives out, my memory gives out, whatever it is. I, I've had it, and then suddenly it's like, where did, where did that go? It's not about what you have this morning. It's about who has you. And, and she, she changes her tune in, in this dark hour, in this, this time where it looks like maybe all hope is lost. She, she, it's no longer about what she has. But now she's rejoicing in the fact it's not that my beloved is mine, but it's I belong to him. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. He's still mine, but the emphasis is now on I am my beloved's because all that the Father has given him will come to him. All that the Father has, he will not lose a one this morning. That there, there's not a, a, a power great enough this morning to overcome the drawing power that, that has been unleashed on you and I this morning. It's not a normal power. It's not a, a, a normal life that, that you and I are called to. And there's a power to bring us into position if we will yield ourselves to it. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. That every day we wake up and we say, Lord, this is what I was wanting to do, but that's not really what's important right now. Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? That, that there's a, a group of people that, that they have a different kind of relationship with the Lord. A lot of people on this earth claim to, that Jesus is theirs. Pray to Jesus, but... Their relationship with him involves a lot of, it's more like a relationship with Santa Claus than a lover. That, oh Lord, I want this, I want this, I want this. I've been pretty good this year. So, you know, it, this is the prioritized list of things I want. And that's their prayer life. If you boil it down, that's their prayer life. And, and you know, it's, it's one thing that, you know, I, I like doing things for my wife. If she tells me that she wants something or wants something done, or, I, I enjoy doing that. She, she says I don't do it enough that she would realize that. But nonetheless, I, I enjoy doing that. Yet if that was the extent of our relationship, that would get old pretty quick. If every time she talked to me, she was saying, what was wrong in her life and what she was lacking and what she really wanted and if I really loved her, would she do this? And, and, and you know, it, uh, after all, I chose her as my wife. It was my decision, so I'm obligated to do this. If that was the extent of our conversation, it wouldn't be a very good relationship. But there are other parts of our relationship where we sit down and we just talk. We, we, we tell each other it's a, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way communication. And, you know, we, we, we talk about having a, a, a love relationship with the Lord Jesus. And, and that's good and that's true. But what we really need to have is a lover relationship with the Lord Jesus. That, you know, love can be a, a one-way thing. You, you might say this morning you've got a love relationship with pecan pie. But that's a very one-sided, one-way street. But God's looking for a lover relationship this morning. Where that, that communication, it goes both ways. It's not just me telling God what I want and hoping he shows up and does it and complaining when he doesn't do it fast enough. But it's a, it's a two-way communication that, that I actually spend time. Lord, I just, I, I just want to spend some time in your presence this morning. I, I, I just want to, Lord, come down in the room. Let, let's just fellowship a little bit this morning it, it's not about what I want it's not about my problems it's not about the the suffering I'm Lord I, I just want to know you greater this morning 
and you spend that time, that, 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 that's when you're really entering into to prayer and fellowship with the Lord, that that's the relationship that we're called to, that, that, that people can, can ask us that, oh, you know, how can you give all of that up for your God? How can you give everything? You know, you, you live so different from the rest of the world. You women, you never cut your hair. You, you don't wear makeup. You, you wear skirts. Uh, how can you do all of that? You men, you, you dress like men. You don't cuss. You, you, you don't go to the bars and parties and, and, and tell the dirty jokes like all the other guys. Uh, how can you give all that up? You're, you're not popular. You, you could have a lot more influence in this world if you just partake a little bit and all that. How can you give all that up? And you're going, give what up? I, I ain't giving anything up. I, I'm living the greatest life there is. I'm in love with my, my Savior this morning. I, I'm in love with my beloved. I am my beloved. I'm not giving. This is what I do to please Him. He's so great. He's one, so wonderful that this is what I do to, because I know that He loves this. This is what I do because I know it pleases Him. It's not about giving things up. It's not about making sacrifices. It's about pleasing Him. That's what I live for. That's, that's what I want my life to, that's what I want my life song to be singing forth. That's the relationship you and I are being called to have now, this morning. Let's stand this morning if the musicians would come. There's a drawing power moving this morning to bring us into this relationship. It's not about just a life of slavery. It's not about a life of service. It's about a, a life of, of pleasing Him. And, and, and when you live that life so surrendered that it's no longer about you, but it's about Him. It's about what He wants you to do. When, when you can come to that place of surrender... The, the God will be glorifying his name through your life. That, that when people come and say, we, we want to see Jesus, you say he's the, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He promised that where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm going to be in the midst thereof. If you're there, can, can, can people say, oh, I see Jesus in that brother's life, or I see Jesus in that sister's life. Can they say that about you this morning? Or do you still have kind of that, that one thing or that one area that you've not been willing to give up yet? Or are, are, are you still have that, that grudge you're holding against somebody because, because you just can't let it go? Are you, are you so uh, stuck on being an American and your rights in this world that you just can't let that go? And people don't see Jesus through you. They say, oh yeah, he, he's so stubborn, he won't do that or... You know, he's so, they're so stubborn that they won't let go of that. It was, that was, happened 30 years ago, and they're still not over it. It's still all they can talk about. What, what song are you singing this morning? Is it all about him? Is it all about how great and how wonderful he is? Or is there still that one part of your life that you're holding on to that blocked Jesus from being glorified in your life? Amen. Let's just sing that song in my life, in key of F. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord.
anybody would like me to pray with you this morning, I invite you forward. The Lord's here. He's moving this morning. Amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. And come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy Blessed Lord, to the cross where 
song before we dismiss manifesting time it's key of e flat the song's been on my heart recently I, uh, most of the verses from this come straight from the book of song of solomon actually so uh, let's just sing this this morning amen the voice of my beloved behold he quickly comes sweeping over the mountains over the hills he runs. I long to hear his voice. I long to hear him say, Arise, my love, my fair one, come away. It's manifesting. 
time. The fruits are on the vine and the lovely one is coming in plain view. Look up, O oh chosen bride, redemption draweth nigh. He's a lovely one, he's coming for me and you. The grapes are yours and mine, little foxes spoil the vine, for the vineyard blossoms forth her harvest time. Keep your eyes on things above, don't look at me or you, see that lovely one, he's coming in plain view. Manifesting time, the fruits are on the vine, and the lovely one is coming in plain view. Look up, O oh chosen bride, redemption draweth nigh. He's a lovely one, he's coming for me and you. In the cleft of the rock in the secret place so high till the day break and the shadows flee away in that mountain place a sweet smell is coming through he's that lovely one he's coming in plain view Yes, it's manifesting time. The fruits are on the vine, and the lovely one is coming in plain view. Look up, O oh chosen bride, redemption draweth nigh. He's a lovely one, he's coming for me and you. plain view to you this morning? Amen. We serve a good God. Amen. I just I just don't even have the words to express my, my love for him. Amen. Brother Josh, would you dismiss us this morning in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, it's been good to be in your house, Lord, to come out, to hear from you, Lord. Lord, we, we desire a closer walk, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the message this morning, Lord. We know you're coming yeah. back for us soon, yeah. Lord. Help us to have our lamps trimmed. Yeah. Lord, Amen. God bless you as you're dismissed this morning. Uh, remember, no service tonight. Uh, Lord willing, if the guitarries will see you again Wednesday. Amen. Let's manifest.